everything that has ever happened is history. And so where do you start? Where do you begin? In my classes, I talk about uh, asking questions is really what you need to learn how to do. But asking questions is a skill. So how do, you, how do you know what's important and what's not important? And how do you even know where to start asking questions? So in terms of world history, uh, I like to, for my first classes, I kind of give this lecture or a version of the lecture I'm about to give which is a broad overview of all human history. I'm going to draw a little bit of a, a visual reference here. Now, does anybody know how long human beings have been around? How long have human beings been human beings? You can type it in the chat or if you wanna unmute real quick, feel, feel free to do that. But uh, does anybody know how long human beings have been human beings? If we had a time door and we reached through the time door and grabbed the first human child, how far back would we have to go to grab that first human child? Any guesses? 200,000 years I've got. That's pretty, pretty solid. It really depends on how you look at it. We've a lot, for a long time, we actually thought that that was roughly where we were were starting at. Um, by some measures, it could be 60,000 years back to the cognitive revolution when we first kind of seemed to have gained consciousness in the way that we know it now. You could go back as far as maybe 500,000, 600,000 years. Where I like to put it is where we've got our first archaeological information about like actual human habitation where humans have lived and like we have actual archaeology, our oldest archaeological data is something like between 300,000 and 330,000 years ago. But just for the purposes of, you know, this, this exercise, um, I'm going to say that we're going to start at 200,000 years ago, um, as someone guessed. So let's say this is 200,000 years ago. This blank void is all of time, right? And the left side of the screen over here is the very beginning of history of that first human baby. And on the right side of the screen over here is now. So I'm going to draw a line from the left side of the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep drawing and I want everybody to pop into the chat and tell me when to stop drawing the line. Um, and I want you to tell me to stop drawing the line when I get to agriculture. When I get to agriculture, go ahead and uh, put it into the chat and tell me to stop. So we're at 200,000 years ago and I keep drawing. Tell me to stop. So we're about 175,000 years ago. Does anybody think I should stop at 175,000? No, I gotta, I gotta keep going. I keep going to fifth, around 100,000 years ago. No, we gotta keep going. And actually the line goes somewhere around here. Agriculture sh first shows up, yeah, around 8,000 years ago for agriculture, how we kind of know it today. We had some early forms of um, intensive cultivation. In, in this intensive cultivation, there were some forms of early agriculture and we had some forms of early civilization, but maybe not cities. If you think about Gobekli Tepe, which is a really old kind of temple compound, but right about here. So if we look at most of human history, the vast majority of the time that human beings have been alive was as hunter gatherers. To, the, uh, to Jake, what we're trying to accomplish is we're, today we're giving an overview of all of human history in 30 minutes. A 
broad, broad overview. And from this point, we have about 10,000 years of agriculture, roughly speaking, where things didn't change very much. Um, I'm going to draw, I've got a couple of things that we want to talk about here. So in, we'll say that ancient Sumer, we'll put it about 4,500 4, BCE. That's not exactly right for Sumer, but we'll put it there because it's smack in the middle at least. 4,500 BCE, this is ancient Sumeria. What percentage of ancient Sumerians were farmers? Feel free to take a guess here. Eighty-five percent, hundred percent, ninety percent—all very close. Greater, it's greater than ninety percent. We can say fairly confidently that it's greater than ninety percent farmers. The vast majority of people are working for a god king, who is at the top of the social hierarchy. And then he's got some guys who are priests and scribes and maybe some professional warriors, but it's not likely that there were a lot of people who were professional fighters necessarily. Military is expensive and they got to feed their families. We're talking here in the, in the chat. Ancient Sumeria is in Mesopotamia in Iraq, modern day Iraq. So now let's zoom ahead to 1820 CE in the United States. Now, think about the perspective here. This is, how many years ago is this? This is something like 6,000 years later from ancient Sumeria in the amount of time, 6,000 years of distance. If you, like, when we think of old, especially in Western civilization, like, the oldest Western civilization that we usually think of when we think of old is like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. But ancient Greece and ancient Rome were around 200 BCE to 200 CE. So we got about a 400 year span around the year zero and ancient Sumeria would have been 4,000 years before ancient Greece. So we, we got to think this is an incredibly long amount of time from 4,000, like ancient Sumeria was twice as old to Greece as Greece is to us. You know, Julius Caesar didn't even know that ancient Sumeria existed. It was wiped off the map. We know more about ancient Sumeria even than the Greeks and Romans did. So what I want you to think about is, well, we've had a ton of time. What percentage of, think of all that progress that must have been made. So what percentage of people in the United States 200 years ago were farmers in 1820? What do you think? 65%? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's a little higher. It's actually, um, I've looked this up. In 1824, it was 84% farmers. Almost no change. We're, we're talking 6,000, maybe even 8,000, depending on how you want to look at it. In that entire span of time, the amount of people it takes to make enough food for everybody is, a, yeah, 6,000 years. Uh, but all of this is approximate. I'm going off the top of my head without my concrete numbers. So I don't feel comfortable saying like, boom, 6,000 some years. I, I like to make sure that it's approximate. But in this amount of time, this 6% drop also it largely happened uh, fairly recently to 1820 um, as part of, well, does anybody know? Well, we'll get there. Don't want to get ahead of myself. So 84% farmers, 6,000 years, almost no change. And in fact, this seemed to be a bit of a hard limit. There was a guy named Malthus, a philosopher slash early sociologist named Thomas Malthus, who 
pretty convincingly argued that as your food production increases, your population increases. So then if your food production decreases, your population, you're going to get a famine and your population decreases. So where our agricultural technology was, you couldn't really kind of get more than about a billion people worldwide because everybody had to be growing food. And if you're too successful, then it, the, anytime anything bad happened, you basically lose a huge chunk of population and you're kind of stuck at that 1 billion worldwide mark. But let's now let's go to this year, uh, which is almost over in the United States. Now, this is only 200 years later. Remember, we've had this incredible amount of time, 6,000 years later, and we've had almost no change. And now it's this year. What percentage of Americans do you think are farmers today? 60%. 15%, pretty, pretty broad sweep, 10%, mm -hmm. 25%. Uh, if, if we actually look at the uh, demographic data, it's actually less than 3% of Americans are farmers today. So this takes us to, uh, th this is in my mind, rather a startling fact because just think about that amount of time where everybody was a farmer and only 200 years ago, everybody was still a farmer. Well, what happened in between that time, between 1820 and 2020, what happened to drop that number so incredibly in a way that it never happened? Exactly. Industrial revolution is exactly right. The Industrial Revolution is a revolution on par with the agricultural revolution in means of, so like we changed completely from say, going back to this here, going back to the hunter-gatherer thing, we had some 200, 300, 400,000, our data isn't great, or we were hunter-gatherers for so long. The agricultural revolution literally changed what it means to be a human being, right? So we went from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. And then the Industrial Revolution did it again over the course from 1820, where we're at 84% farmers. In the 1930s, it was still 40, 45, 50% farmers. And it's only been in the last 40 to 50 years that more and more people have left the farms because it's no longer economically viable for them to make money or kind of make a living. So I like to draw human history in kind of a chart like this. It also happens to line up with a geographic map of the United States, kind of. So you have the Rocky Mountains in the West, and then the vast plains of the in, in, interior United States, and the Appalachian Mountains, which are not as big, but it's not a perfect metaphor. So these, big bumps represent the periods of change. In ge geographically speaking, if you got a mountain range, one side of the mountain range is gonna be one kind of climate, one kind of geographic biological situation. And on the other side of the mountain range, you're gonna have a different geographic biological situation because mountains are a big barrier. Life doesn't, trans doesn't go over the mountains easily. Moisture doesn't go over the mountains easily. That's why you often have, with a big mountain range, you have deserts. So mountains make a difference. So we have the ag revolution here, and then we have the industrial revolution here. And on either side, you have a different explanation of what it means to be human. So here we're hunter-gatherers, here we are farmers, called ourselves workers. If we called ourselves workers, and maybe if you think about it, maybe some of you know farmers. It certainly is possible, if, especially if, you know, it, there's still plenty of farmers in the world, but you maybe don't know any. And a lot of times students don't know any farmers, anyone who is a farmer. I want to ask yourself, who do you know works in a factory? Who do you know goes to a factory every day you know, has a giant vat of molten steel that they pour steaming into giant, make giant ships and make things. 
I bet not many of you actually know someone who works in a factory, which that's where everybody went in the Industrial Revolution. Even in the 1960s in the United States, the population of the United States that was uh, a member of a, a labor union was 60%. 60% of Americans were in labor unions in the 1960s. Well, what percentage do you think of Americans are in labor unions today? Just as a guess, how many, what percentage of Americans are kind of industrial laborers today? 2% is too low. Yeah, George got it in one. Yeah, 15%. In just like 30, 40 years, the percentage of people in labor unions, the number of workers in factories due to, well, we've had arguably another revolution since then, even in a shorter amount of time. Um, and even arguably, you could put another one there on top of it or multiple ones. Some people are arguing that we've had multiple ones. And I, I might put it as a single one, but we had an information revolution. Computers themselves were a revolution that changed how to do business. And then in the 90s, you had, so you had like 20, 30 years of computers. Then you had about 20 years where it's just the internet. You guys are definitely don't remember where the pre smartphone era, I'm sure, but smartphones changed things too. So computers were like a revolution in and of themselves. The internet was a revolution in computers. And then smartphones were kind of a revolution in the combination of both computers and the internet combined and we're carrying them around with us everywhere. And we may have gone through three industrial revolutions in the space that it took, you know, the industrial revolution a hundred years, we've done three in a hundred years or, or less, like, or more arguably, we don't know where we're at. We don't know how to, how, uh, how to measure ourselves or call ourselves because a hunter gatherer, that's what they do. They hunt and they gather. A farmer farms, right? A worker goes to the factory and works. But what do we do? Some might argue we're consumers. Some might argue that we're office workers or we're thinkers. It's hard to say creators. It's hard to say exactly where we're at. But regardless, now we are very far away from where we were in the hunter-gatherer period. And it's happened in a the geologic blink of a time, blink of an eye. And so I want to even put that into clearer. Because if we draw this line, this line at the bottom, this increasing line is really a measure of how much information is available to any given human at any given time. And in your pocket, uh, you have access to more information than would have been available to all of the hunter gatherers up until this point. Now, an individual hunter gatherer was very intelligent in their own way, especially after the cognitive revolution somewhere around like 60,000 years ago. And they would have had to do everything by themselves. And so, with that in mind, we are not individually maybe as capable as a hunter-gatherer, but as a society, we have access to more information than 190,000 years of hunter-gatherers combined. In your pocket, you have more information than every one of those hunter-gatherers would ever have combined. And so that's, that's kind of where we're at. This is the extent of, the, uh, of, our, of world history from, from hunter-gatherers till now. This is the broad overview. The agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution are two extraordinarily important events that really draw the line. If I wanted to dig a little deeper, um, we can start zooming in. Um, this is kind of the zoomed out global view of all of history, um, but there's even a further out direction that we can go. And we've also got like, if we zoom in one more click, we start to see other geographic features like right here around 1492 you have the voyage of columbus for the europeans to discover the new world in north and south america and that fundamentally changed a lot of things about being human not really so much as much as the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution
but still the Colombian exchange is almost as important as the agricultural and industrial revolutions. It's just, I'd say, you know, not quite S tier. But then we can zoom out a further click and we could look at all of geologic time. And uh, we could say, I could draw a picture of the Empire State Building, right? That where the bottom line is, this is a pretty classic uh, metaphor, but the bottom line there is, I'm, I'm trying to draw <laughs> the Empire State Building on the world's worst graphics program. But then, so if we start here and this bottom line is the big bang, we can then travel up the Empire State Building here and, you know, tell me to stop when I get to human beings, right? This is the Big Bang, some 6.7-ish billion years ago, as far as we can imagine, because we can't really know, like, totally, totally. Um, and people have been, now well, I'm going off topic, but I'm going to draw the line straight up this 6.7 billion year tower, and you tell me when to stop when I get to, like, even you know, Australopithecus. If we keep going up, well, just to save time, I won't mess around, but if we keep going up, it, it's nothing. It, there's, there, you can barely measure it. The amount of time on top of the, the Empire State Building that human beings have been around are about as thick as that line that I just drew on top of the Empire State Building. It's about a coin's thickness on top of the Empire State Building. It's three seconds to midnight on New Year's Eve if the Big Bang is January 1st, New Year's Day. So we can zoom all the way out. I do love zooming all the way out. I do like looking at like how the laws of physics have shaped history, but mostly for AP purposes, obviously we got to stay focused. And for AP purposes, if we're doing test prep, we, we start right here. I try to give a little bit of context so we can understand the importance of the industrial, uh, the importance of the agricultural revolution and the importance of the Columbian exchange. But the line that we really got to start with, we do everything from the Columbian Exchange forward since they changed the test. So that's the story of history, quickly told. Mm -hmm.